so wonderful to be here. And I have to say I'm really nervous because <laughs> first we had Billy and Simon's, both of which were wonderful, polished presentations with beautiful images. And then we've had these students who absolutely blow me away <laughs> at how professional they are and how they know exactly what they're going to say. And they've obviously been practicing. <laughs> and so I'm, you know, I'm really nervous. So <laughs> please forgive me. Um, I was asked to talk about international conservation, and that is a very broad subject. Um, so I quickly asked when I was asked if I could speak, if I could just focus on transboundary uh, international conservation and just mention a few examples, um, illustrative examples of what's going on in the world. So do I hit the arrow button? Okay. So as you all know, there is a lot going on in international marine conservation around the world. And this international marine conservation is happening at a variety of different scales. Um, I've kind of parsed it down into three major scales, which I think um, you could categorize all the international efforts in the world around, not including the kind of global marine international agreements and conversations that are happening, including the very important upcoming climate change negotiations taking place in Paris in December, which will have a significant focus on ocean ecosystems. But uh, other kinds of international marine conservation um, can be focused at um, the very small scale. And that international um, conservation um, takes the form of either bilateral aid or foundation aid or even private sector support that originates in one country and is um, then transferred to another country in order to do all kinds of marine conservation interventions, most typically marine protected areas. So that is an example where um, there is international collaboration to make something happen in a particular place. Then we have a slightly larger scale where you have international cooperation um, to do marine conservation across borders um, with neighboring countries that attempt to either harmonize legislation or actually develop management plans to do joint management over shared resources or shared space. So, and in general, we can identify these kinds of um, transboundary er areas where there are either activities going on today or there's the potential for activities in marine conservation in the future. And then at the largest scale, we have international marine conservation happening at a kind of regional scale, where you have many countries working towards common goals with common standards, um, in many cases with harmonized legislation. So we have rules and regulations that are the same on all sides of the borders. And then, in many cases, these countries bound a high seas areas area, which then also gets affected by these kind of common standards and common approaches towards a shared agenda for marine conservation. And these kinds of large-scale marine conservation um, activities take place within what we call large marine ecosystems, of which there are many in the world, or even the formally legally established regional seas, um, of which there are fewer. Um, and now, when I came um, some time ago to talk to the students. Oh, I'm stuck on this slide. I, is that a, well, okay. So you can see various kinds of scales um, for international cooperation. When I came last time, I spoke to the students about international um, cooperation within the context of the Mediterranean Regional Seas Convention, which is the Barcelona Convention. And I'd like to just very, very briefly um, touch upon the Mediterranean again, but to talk about something slightly different within the Barcelona Convention, which is the activities going on in the northern Adriatic. And I just wanted to mention this because I had the opportunity in April, since I saw you all last, um, to teach an Erasmus uh, Mundus master's course in marine spatial planning where the students are and the faculties are very focused on the northern Adriatic as a planning area. So I'll just mention that briefly. And then I really want to spend um, a few minutes to talk about the Benguela current LME in uh, southern Africa. 
So as you all know, uh, because some of you are actually from the region, many of you read the news and um, know what's going on in this region, and then we had the opportunity to discuss marine conservation within this region. This is a real hotbed of conflict and human use, also a lot of very important values, marine values, uh, or human values at attached to marine places and marine resources in this region. So there is a lot going on in the Mediterranean. Very, very complicated place to get um, any kind of agreement to do anything at all. Um, that said, there is a lot of good um, progress being made in marine conservation in the Mediterranean, both at the regional scale, so across the whole of the basin, including all of the 22 entities that are parties to the convention, and then um, in specific subregions. And I had talked when I was here last time about the Pelagos Marine Sanctuary, which was mentioned this morning, uh, and then some of the work in Greece. But where I want to go um, quickly now is just to the Adriatic Sea, which is here to the east of the boot, um, and in particular focus on the northern Adriatic. Uh, you see that the countries that bound this small sub-region in the Mediterranean include developed countries like Italy, developing countries um, of Europe like Slovenia and Croatia, Bosnia and Albania. Um, Greece is actually not a part of the Adriatic planning effort um, because the boundary is to the north. But uh, there is a very wide variety of capacity in this region to do marine conservation and to do marine science. Um, and there is a very wide range of environmental regulations, both on land and at sea, within these countries. Uh, the region, if you know it at all, is characterized by things that people um, love and things that people hate. So on the love side, uh, we have you know, some of the greatest tourist attractions in the world, including the Venice Lagoon and Venice as a city. Uh, a lot of marine biodiversity. People are always surprised that the Mediterranean is as diverse and as rich as it is. However, on the downside, the Adriatic is one of the most polluted places on the earth. It's a place where uh, the people that have been studying soft-bodied uh, organisms um, and mucilages, which are these uh, blooms of gelatinous creatures, um, the, the blooming related to um, pollution that comes from land-based sources primarily. Uh, this is a place that's highly polluted and highly used and is, um, as you can see from the map, very t closely um, you know, affected by those countries and shared um, in, by countries in very close proximity. So I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I did want to mention this ADRA plan, which is an ongoing thing. It just actually started up. It's a marine spatial planning process to try and take stock of the information that exists for the Adriatic in terms of uh, the oceanography, the marine biology, so the distribution of species, the ecosystem services. There's been a lot of effort to map and value ecosystem services and understand how those values are being affected by human use, um, and then develop various kinds of plans, um, as you all have done for the Sargasso, to try and address some of these things, uh, some of these threats to these values. Um, Billy mentioned the Orinoco River and the plumes of um, uh, pollutants and sediments that come out of that. Here in this region, we have the Po River, uh, in Italy, which is dumping an enormous amount of pollutants into this area. And for that reason, this can't be an entirely marine conservation focused activity. It's got to be land use planning and marine conservation jointly. Um, the other thing I would like to say about this before I go on to the real example, which is Africa, um, is that this is an interesting project because as it will unfold, it will present a, very, a variety of scenarios to policymakers and planners so that they can go in any number of directions with a marine spatial plan. It's not meant to present one optimal plan and have it be embraced by um, all of the, the relevant countries. I don't think that would work in, in the Mediterranean. <laughs> 
there is no straight road to an agreement in a Mediterranean context. So by presenting various options and the kind of costs and benefits associated with various kinds of marine conservation plans, um, the citizens and the policymakers, decision makers, can debate the various options and decide on the best, the best policy. So because I want to go quickly and get away from the podium and allow the students to make, continue to make their great presentations, I'm going to quickly move to Africa and specifically to the Benguela current um, system, which is here in the southern um, part of Western Africa. Uh, the Benguela current um, LME spans three countries, Angola, Namibia, and South Africa. Um, it's characterized by very, very high productivity. So this and the Humboldt current system are the most productive in the world. Enormous amount of fisheries resources being pulled out from, from this upwelling system. Uh, but it's an area that supports a lot of other biodiversity. Um, of course, it's a desert region for the most part. Um, so there's a lot of interesting desert bi biodiversity and biota. Uh, very, very important for bird life. And um, on the marine side, a very interesting both uh, benthic diversity and, of course, a very um, diverse and productive pelagic community. Um, there is all kinds of ecotourism going on, beginning to go on um, in this region. The, the countries. South Africa, Namibia in particular, are really heavily invested in developing tourism, but it's been uh, oriented towards um, you know, your classic um, terrestrial species and less so for the marine side. So this is now an emerging kind of use. Um, there are giant seal rookeries. There's a lot of whale watching. Uh, there's a lot of bird watching and so forth. Uh, it is also an area that's used very heavily industrially, so there's oil and gas development um, and many, many other uses. Uh, there is a kind of hierarchy of planning in Benguela, and that's really why I wanted to touch upon this particular example to talk about international marine conservation. So um, the hierarchy has to do with um, kind of different scales of um, agreement and different ways that conservation projects are kind of rolling out in this region. So at the largest scale, the region is covered by an agreement. Um, but even larger than the Benguela um, current commission region is this Abidjan Convention uh, region, which spans the whole of West Africa. So all the way from Mauritania, all the way around down around West Africa um, to, to the Benguela um, region itself. And then at the smaller scale within the Benguela region and the three countries that form that commission um, are national efforts and even local efforts to do marine conservation of various kinds. So on the large scale, we have these three countries that began discussions. They realized that they had a common agenda for protecting the very, very productive upwelling area, but also the islands that are in this um, more closer to shore than the upwelling area. Um, so they started discussions. They had a, a they were, Ken Sherman uh, was one of, this was one of the first LMEs that was actually described by him. Um, and they quickly kind of developed an identity which was the Benguela identity and that incorporated the, the interests of all three countries. They received some significant global environment facility funding from the World Bank and um, they were able to do the baseline studies that could characterize the various management plans that have flown, come out of that process. Um, and then they set up more recently the Benguela Current Commission um, and legally binding mechanisms within the Current Commission um, to be able to resolve marine management issues. At the smaller scale, I just want to focus very quickly on Namibia because it's a, just a wonderful country that's been doing so much. I mean, South Africa has been doing a lot as well, but Namibia has been doing things in a very organized manner that, um, that I'd like to focus on because it's really interesting the way they tie in their land planning their coastal planning and their marine offshore planning together. So 
in Namibia, they created the Namibian Islands um, Marine Protected Area, which is in this area here. Um, the boundary with Angola is up here, and the boundary with South Africa is just at the bottom of the map. So the um, Marine Protected Area is this colored, the whole colored region. Um, the conservation objectives of the Namibian Islands MPA, it, it, thank you, it makes it sound like it's just about islands, but it's about more than islands. It's a, the entire, basically the entire marine area of Namibia, the territorial sea. So the objectives include protecting conservation hotspots and spawning grounds for important fisheries. Um, some of the offshore islands, both the terrestrial and the marine areas around. But the objectives also relate to sound management and conservation of marine resources, improve vigilance. Um, but most importantly, I want to flag this one, which is, and by the way, I just cut and copied, uh, copied and pasted from their, um, from their management plan. So this is actually their words and their objectives, not, not what I imagine. Um, this though, really struck me as important, which is the protected area is a way to show that Namibia has a commitment to marine conservation. And not just to, to have Namibia say that it wants to do marine conservation or that it's committed to the conservation of the Benguela current, but to actually show that it is doing something about it. And I think that's very, very important to flag. Uh, I wanted to say also that the marine protected area kind of mirrors what's happening on the coast. So on the coast we have these are the various zones for the protected area. On the coast, we now have um, two national parks that span the entire coastline of Namibia. And I don't know why these buttons don't like me. <laughs> Can you? Thank you. Um, these two uh, parks that span the entire Namibian coast. And then, in addition, Namibia has developed a coastal management plan that was done entirely through a participatory process involving endless numbers of community meetings um, along the whole of the, the country's coast. And really, the, the coastal plan reflects very much the needs and desires of all of those communities. So it's an interesting example where national parks instituted on land are complementary to the marine parks and then these participatory plans developed by communities um, to effectively, sustainably use the resources. Do I have the next slide? Thank you. I just want to mention something because the first student presentation spoke to, that was the overview of the management plan, spoke to the need to look to emerging threats or emerging uses and how critically important that is. And in this case, Namibia has been very focused on the fact that diamond mining is moving from land offshore. And they are able to, through their marine planning within the context of the Benguela Commission, start to establish areas that they want to keep mining out of in the future, even though that activity is very, very limited right now today. So it's very important to be proactive and, um, and look forward. So my last slide, just to mention some of the lessons from both case studies, really. One is that we all know that transboundary cooperation is needed to conserve these open systems, particularly those that are heavily used by human beings. Um, we know that transboundary can, cooperation can include things like financial flows, so funding f flowing from one area to the next, technology transfer, um, capacity building in places like Cuba where we can't transfer technology but we can help build capacity. Uh, and by actual joint management of these areas. The last point I want to make, though, is that small-scale efforts, where the rubber really hits the road, where we actually see human behavior change with these small-scale projects, are important not only to promote what I call real conservation, so real human behavior change and real um, outcomes, good outcomes, but they can also spur further international cooperation by signaling that a country, a community, a user group is really serious about doing marine conservation. So with that, I'd like to end, and I really appreciate the opportunity to come and learn from you all and to be so, you know, I have the opportunity to be recharged 
every time I come here, and this time in particular, I am just so optimistic about the future now to know that the world is in your hands. So thank you very much. except that there's been now much more of a focus on an ecosystem approach to fishery and a much more um, serious look at how the fish, fisheries resources um, support the wider biodiversity. Because now these other values have been flagged, and so now as marine ecotourism expands, we want to know that the fishing is not going to preempt their future potential for ecotourism. Um, but there are also very specific protocols being developed on, for instance, the mining activities, and that all three countries will be able to identify within the commission um, activities these areas that will be no-go for, for expanded diamond mining, which is, uh, you know, it's a threat that I never anticipated, but these um, mining operations are the technology this is the downside of advances in technology, right? When we have the, the positive aspects of being able, you know, to track species and to be able to do global sensing, the downside is there's no area that's, you know, out of out of the picture when it comes to things like massive mining operations. <coughs> or sustainably mined um, diamonds. Um, right now, the, all of the effort, though, is to identify ecologically important and critical sensitive areas um, to at least have that as a kind of, um, those areas kind of redlined uh, as a temporary kind of holding measure to keep the mine, because right now the mining is expanding very rapidly for sure, and there's you know, an idea that um, the kinds of, future mechanisms like certification or some kind of campaign for, I don't know how, what form that takes, but, but that'll come later. The first, the most important thing right now is to identify areas that, can, that should be off limits and so we gather more information and think about more possibilities for control. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> yeah, no, is it me or is it you? So I have a bad one. Yeah, I think it was just <laughs> One last question. Yeah. Um, how wealthy is the new view? The reason I ask is I hear sometimes people say things like, oh, well, environmental conservation is a luxury for wealthy lefty liberal nations, and the world is starving and has no, you know, no room for this. How wealthy is the new view? It seems to be doing quite a bit for environmental conservation. Uh, well, the, I, the new is not terribly wealthy. The, 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 Mining companies are very wealthy, 
those are multinational companies that are not in Namibia. I don't know, Namibia has a stake, but uh, I, I don't think Namibia is particularly wealthy, but what Namibia is, um, what is true about Namibia, which sets it apart from other African countries, is the population density is quite low. So you still have um, vast areas of the desert and um, even forested areas in, uh, in the north and in, in the interior that are still pretty pristine. Um, so uh, Namibia is asset wealthy, maybe not as financially wealthy, certainly not a developed country, so a developing country. my experience is there's more opportunities to go to conservation in less wealthy nations because the opportunity costs for not developing are lower. In other words, <laughs> right? So, you know, you have property values in places like the U.S. and Europe and elsewhere, rich countries where the coastal properties are so valuable to poor uh, that to leave them off the table for development incurs a huge opportunity cost, right? So there's a lot of pressure to develop, whereas in the developing countries that are poorer, there's less pressure. So um, one way to look at it. Do you have other examples worldwide of cooperation between coastal and marine parks? There aren't as many examples as we would like and as we need. How important do you think they are? I think it's incredibly important. Well, we, we're seeing now, so as the move, world moves much more towards an ecosystem-based management approach in all, in all kind of realms, uh, we see that we recognize those connections and I think there's more of an attempt. Now, uh, in places like the US where we have regional planning going on, regional marine spatial, coastal marine spatial planning, we call it, like here in the Northeast, and you know, we can address this. There is um, very much an attempt to try to tie in both stakeholders from the interior and you know, from related to land and freshwater, but also the government agencies that deal with those domains. And so um, I think you know, everybody knows that it has to be integrated across land, freshwater, and marine. Um, and everybody also knows and has known for a long time that marine planning really has to take into account not just the pelagic areas, but also the near shore, all the way you know, across up into the land side of the coastal zone. Um, but very few countries have actually executed that kind of integrated planning. Uh, but we're, we're moving in that direction now. And you know, we're seeing that happen at various scales. So we can talk about the specific examples. Thank you so much. Thank you.